Luke chapter 11. <clears throat> Beginning in verses, uh, verse 37, we looked uh, through verse about 45 uh, last week. And what we have here is Jesus is at the home of a Pharisee and he's dining with him. And Jesus did not go through the ceremonial washings um, as the Pharisees expected everyone to do. And, and Jesus began to denounce their attitude and the things that they were doing uh, as far as uh, perverting uh, the religion of Israel, the religion that was given to Israel from Moses, adding to it and, and, and not doing what they should be doing. He said in verse 39, You Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but inward parts is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones did not he who made the outside make the inside also. <clears throat> and so he's condemning them for being more concerned with outer clean, cleanliness rather than inner purity. Their, their religion was superficial. It was on the outside only. And that was what he was condemning. He said, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. And he says, verse 41, <coughs> but rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Uh, but woe unto you, Pharisees. And he's using the type of language that you find in prophets where God through the prophet would denounce a nation for their wickedness. And Luke chapter 11 and verse 42 Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe men and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So uh, he's condemning them for, for being e extreme in their, in their uh, obedience to God, but not fulfilling what the will of God is in their life. In other words, uh, they were more concerned with the outer workings of, of obedience rather than it being from a heart that's genuine, that is a heart that loves God and is serving God. Um, he is not condemning them for their meticulous, uh, detailed obedience, but it's from the wrong source. They're not, they're not uh, obeying the other things that are in the law of God. So they are in, out of balance, so to speak. Verse 43, Woe to you Pharisees! For you love the best seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you Pharisees, uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like the graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. So he's denouncing the Pharisees, which was the prominent religious group uh, there in Israel at the time. And he's saying, you like exaltation. You like to be in the spotlight. You like the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. In other words, you like human recognition. You like attention to be drawn to you. And, and that reminds me of the religious uh, people of today that have certain uh, clothing that they wear to identify them as clergy. They are the clergy and, and they want to be recognized as such because of their, their outward clothing that they wear. Verse 44, he talks about uh, the scribes and the Pharisees who were hypocrites and uh, how that they were, they were wicked on the inside. And it's like a, an unmarked grave. Under the law of Moses, graves were to be marked so people would not walk on them. He says, you're like an unmarked grave that people walk over and as a result, they don't know that they're walking on a grave. They, they don't realize what's on the inside of you. And, of course, that's decay and corruption. And in verse 45, Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. That word reproach can be translated insult us. You are insulting us too. Jesus here is using tough love. He loved them. But he's using what we call tough love to get them to realize the kind of characters they were. And so, verse 46, Woe to you also lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. 
In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore, the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it will be required of this generation. So as you see here, he is denouncing the lawyers. The lawyers were the experts in the law, what we would call today scholars. They were the scholarly experts in the law of Moses. However, they didn't follow it. They did not follow it. And he says, you burden people with laws and, and things that are too hard to bear. Verse 46, all these rules and regulations that don't come from God. You, you bound them on people and you don't lift a finger to try to help them. So you want to burden people with all of these rules and regulations that are too much to bear. Uh, you build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. Your, your ancestors, you're like your ancestors of the Old Testament who persecuted and killed the prophets who were sent by God to them. And so he's condemning them for their attitude. And he says, in fact, verse 48, you bear witness that you approve of their deeds, that is, the killing of the prophets, uh, for they killed them and you build their tombs. So there's that attitude that's still there among the religious leadership of Israel that is uh, present with Jesus that was in the past with the prophets of the past. And it says in verse 49, the wisdom of God says, I'm going to send prophets, I'm going to send apostles. Christ is the wisdom of God. He is the word of God, the word that was made flesh, the word that was with God in the beginning. John chapter 1 and verse 1, John 1 and verse 14. So the wisdom of God is going to send prophets and apostles to them. Of course, that would refer to the apostles that we are familiar with in the New Testament, the prophets who would be spokesmen like Stephen in the book of Acts, who was one of the first uh, disciples of Christ after the establishment of the church to be killed for preaching the gospel. And it says, verse 50, that the blood of all the prophets that was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Now notice something. This is something that's very interesting that I've never seen before. You learn something all the time when you study the Bible. The blood of all the prophets from the foundation of the world, verse 51, the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Abel is called a prophet here. Now how many here knew that Abel was a prophet? I didn't till recently. Abel, Jesus calls him a prophet. All the prophets from the foundation of the world, from Abel, starting with him, to Zechariah, who was killed in 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 through uh, 21. So Abel here, Jesus gives him the distinguishing characteristic of a prophet. That means God spoke through Abel. Does that not put some more light on the fact that when he sacrificed, his instructions on how to sacrifice came from God? And that Cain, his brother, did not sacrifice correctly according to the will of God, and therefore Cain killed Abel, a prophet of God? I did not even know and realize that Abel was uh, classified as one of the prophets. But he is one of the prophets of God. That's why it says from the foundation of the world, Abel, Cain and Abel lived right after the creation, right after the fall. And therefore, you have a prophet of God, God speaking through Abel concerning his will and Cain resisting that and killing him. Now, if you turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 20 through 21, you find the account of Zechariah. This is not the Zechariah uh, that wrote the book of Zechariah. It's a different one. There are numerous people in the Old Testament called Zechariah. And here is uh, one of them. He is a, a prophet of God. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 24, verses 20 through 21. So then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehodiah, the priest, 
who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, Why do you transgress, transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, He has also forsaken you. Then it says, uh, verse 21, They conspired against Him, and at the command of the king, they stoned Him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Jesus said He died uh, in the court of the temple. Verse 51 of Luke chapter 11, He perished between the altar and the temple in the court of the Lord. They executed him. And that represents the kind of the ending of the, the Old Testament. So from the beginning of, and the ending of the Old Testament as a whole, here has been the attitude of people towards the prophet of God. Kill him. Now things aren't going to change when the Son of God, who is the greatest prophet of all, is on earth. What are they going to say to him? Crucify him. Why? He condemned their sinful behavior. Abel condemned sinful behavior and his brother Cain got him killed. Zechariah condemned the sinful behavior of the people of God. It got him killed. Jesus is condemning the sinful behavior of the religious leaders of his day. It's going to get him killed. Human nature doesn't change. And we will see that a little bit later on in the chapter, Luke chapter 11. Verse 52, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourself, and those who enter in you hinder. So you've taken away the key. The key there represents entrance into. If I have a key to a door, I have access into a building. If I have a key to a, a, an automobile, I have access to that automobile. The key to knowledge is access to knowledge and access to God's will. You're supposed to be the law. You're supposed to be teaching the people. But you have taken away the key of knowledge so that they could know the will of God. And you won't go in yourself into the knowledge of the will of God. And you hinder those who would go in. That verse right there reminds me of denominational preachers today. Who are smart who've got a Bible right in front of them. However, they impose their interpretation, their tradition, their, their, their uh, things that have been handed down uh, to them from their uh, theological seminaries and from their denominational uh, teaching institutions onto the people. And therefore, the pastor, what the pastor says, what the preacher says in a particular denomination, what a priest says, that, that's what goes. And therefore, they take away the key of knowledge. They won't enter into uh, an, a true understanding of the will of God, and they hinder people who would. Now, keep in mind where this is taking place. This is in the house of the Pharisee who asked him to come eat with him. And so he, using tough love, denounces their attitude, denounces their behavior, denounces what they do. And as I said last week, they didn't say thank you for that sermon. Appreciate you stepping on my toes. That was a good lesson. Verse 53 and 54, As he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something that he might say that they might accuse him. They assailed him vehemently. And from this point on, they're going to start plotting how they could kill him. What can they get him to do? What can they get him to say? And when you study the book of John, its account, they're trying to get him to blaspheme. They're trying to get him to say something that's contrary to the law of Moses so they could pick up stones to kill at him, or throw him and, uh, at him and kill him. They, they want him dead. They, their heart is so hard that they will not turn from their attitude. So this is, this is the, the way that people get when they are steeped in religious tradition and 
and they're, they're full of pride and not able to humble themselves and say, perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps this rabbi from Nazareth is, is teaching the truth. And they're not willing to do that because of their pride and their arrogance to, to, to look at the scriptures for what it actually says. Any questions or comments about chapter 11 before we go any further? The lawyers actually recognize when he's talking about the Pharisees, right. just like they are. Right. We're the ones seeking these seats. We're the ones doing these things. Yeah, we're doing all this because when they say you insult us too, oh, we're just like they are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, you know, they didn't go away scratching their head and saying, "What did what did what did Jesus mean when he said that?" They knew exactly who he was talking about. I mean, they were talking about the Pharisees. And yeah. They, they're pointing. Yeah, that you're insulting sense. us too. You're so, they're coming and saying, okay, now you're insulting us too, saying these same things because we're just like they are. Making practical application of his message. Hey, you're, what you're saying is, is hitting us as well. And so... Instead of the, taking it as a positive, they took it as a negative. Exactly. Yeah. They actually recognized that they were just like the Pharisees. We always hear about the Pharisees mm -hmm. and the Sadducees and the scribes. Right. And you don't think about the lawyers being just like they were, but they were. They were the ones doing the same thing, seeking those same type glory of men. Seeking exaltation, seeking recognition, seeking, uh, wanting to be in a prominent place, wanting to be seen. Uh, that, that attitude of, uh, look at me, I'm a, I'm a leader of God's people. And instead of saying, I'm a servant of God's people. The shepherds of Israel, you read the book of Ezekiel, there, uh, God through Ezekiel denounces the shepherds who were supposed to be serving God's people and helping the sheep to know God. They were neglecting their responsibilities, and He denounced them very strongly. He said, "I'm going to, I'm going to punish you because you are scattering the sheep. You're not feeding the sheep." That's basically what Jesus is saying here, and they are cross-examining Him, assailing Him vehemently. And they're trying, they're putting him under a microscope to find some sort of fault so they can say, aha, there's his error. There's what's wrong with him. Now, they're going to do that with the people of God today. You know what? They're going to find faults because we're not perfect. And so that, that's going to happen to us today as we try to live, live the Christian life and we take a stand against uh, false relig religion. They're going to cross-examine us and assail us vehemently and lie in wait, try to see if they can catch us in something. Uh, it happens all the time. Chapter 12 and verse 1 <clears throat> of Luke. In the meantime, when an, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now here is a crowd of people, and he is warning them about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now, in, in uh, Matthew's account, uh, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, uh, he says to his disciples, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's warning them about both of those religious groups in Matthew's account. And they thought he was talking about bread, and he, he later on taught them in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 16, how is it that you, you do not understand that I'm not speaking uh, uh, concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So here you have Jesus warning people about a religious group. Here's who they are, and here's what you need to be aware of. Their hypocrisy and their doctrine. And we should do that today in, in a spirit that's loving and caring. Beware of this group. This is who they are. Here's what they teach. Yes. Mm -hmm. from Jesus' perspective. From the Pharisee's perspective, I consider 
am I being uh, pharisaic to mm-hmm. other people that are around me? Mm-hmm. I know, I think just growing up in the church, there was one day it dawned on me, I just, I felt like, um, you know, I know the Bible tells us to be, we have to be in the world, of course, not to be of the world. Mm-hmm. And I considered myself to be superior to mm-hmm. people that were in the world. And it, like I said, it's, I guess it was just something that um, it was subconscious, didn't really think all that much about, probably just because of being raised in the church. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, you know, that shouldn't be. I right. shouldn't consider myself I'm no better than the other person. And I think, you know, going down and being pharisaical about things, um, uh, they, they believe in their works, and that's one of the things Jesus emphasized here. I know uh, we, we within the church, it's a great thing that we study our Bibles the way that we do. But whenever we look at it as, okay, today I've memorized, you know, a whole chapter, and uh, you get through a day and you don't apply any of that to your life, and people in the world see you, and, and you consider yourself to be superior, but you aren't applying what you're reading, uh, that's damaging. And then, Growing up from Jesus' perspective, I'm wondering if I can be like Christ in it if I were invited to a friend's home who's not of the church, but of the world, and tell them in a loving way, you know, this isn't right what you're doing. Right. And address that in, in, the, way that, in the way that Christ is doing here. Those are two very good points because <clears throat> we can fall into the the attitude of the Pharisees uh, of being better than other people in which I describe it this way. We're not better than anyone else, but we're trying to live better than everyone else. Because if we live the, and follow Jesus Christ, we're going to live above the morality of the world, but we're not better than anyone in the world. Like one preacher described it, we're just one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. However, having that knowledge of where the bread is doesn't make me any better than the other beggar. But we shouldn't lose confidence in the fact we know where the bread is. So there, there's a difference in, in, in confidence and arrogance. And I think sometimes that, gets, that can get mixed up. We can be confident in what, what, uh, what we're teaching, if we're teaching in harmony with the will of God, without being arrogant about it and and having a humble attitude of how we approach someone in a, in a certain situation. The religious world, as I've said before, they don't care what we do here as long as we don't say they're wrong. If they can get us to just agree to disagree, then we would live in harmony. But that can't happen if, if we take what the Bible says and, and we're going to follow it uh, exactly as it as it teaches, then then truth and error cannot coexist peacefully, and we we don't trust in in what we're doing at all as far as our own righteousness that we're good enough to be the people of God. We're the people of God so that we can live a good life and we we uh, obey the gospel, become God's people, and and uh, we should not have that superior attitude. It's like the, uh, the two people that went to the temple to pray that Jesus talked about, the Pharisee and the, and the publican. And the Pharisee prayed that he was glad that he wasn't like other people. And we should have the attitude of the publican or, or the tax collector who would not even lift up his head but beat his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's the one, Jesus said, went down to his house justified rather than the other. So there, there is no room for any type of boasting or bragging or arrogance that is that is condemned as an attitude at the same time we can still have confidence uh, in the truth of God's word and and have the attitude of show me if we are wrong show me where we are wrong where we're going astray and 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 we open ourselves up to that. If someone can show us what we're doing that's out of harmony with the will of God, we should be humble enough to say, okay, that's what we need to do. Yes? Christians have privileges and blessings far beyond 
for the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we need to be careful that, that we live up to the privilege. Right. And I think that is, uh, if we can consider that, uh, we, we shouldn't get big hands. Right? Exactly. Uh, these things, uh, prayer and forgiveness and watchful care over we as Christians have the privilege that others don't. Exactly. And we need to be sure that we live up to our privilege as long as we're here. And, and, and it's like Israel of old. They were chosen to be a, 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 a people to, when you, when you read the Old Testament, to really shine as a light in the world of this is how God's people should be. But then they started building walls around themselves and started focusing inward on them that they were better than everyone else. And they looked down on everyone else. But you find in the scripture, you know, even when we've looked through Luke, how that Jesus found greater faith outside of Israel than he did among his own disciples. He condemned his own disciples for having little faith and then marveled at the great faith of the centurion who was not of Israel. So it's not a matter of, of, of our own identity. It's being uh, in Christ. And as uh, Ned said, all the privileges that we have, that we should be humble and thankful for them and not arrogant and boastful. Another thing that can keep us from being proud about even what we may know of the Scripture, what we know, is something that Brother Freed made a comment about once before when I talked to him. He said, and he's been preaching, I don't know how many years now, but he's going mm-hmm. back. He said, I go back, and he said, I reevaluate everything we mm-hmm. do within the church right. to make sure that we can prove that what we are doing is correct. Sure. And if we're doing that, constantly reevaluating, why do we do this? Mm-hmm. Then, you know, if somebody comes to you and says you're doing something wrong, then if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and you can sit down and explain to them through the scriptures because you've already questioned them. Mm-hmm. And it keeps us from being proud because we're constantly searching to make sure of what we're doing. Exactly. We're searching the scriptures daily. Uh, I think it's Acts 17, 11. We're like the noble Bereans, searching the scriptures daily and, and making sure that, that what we're doing and what we're uh, teaching is in harmony with the will of God. And that, that is something that we should always have uh, as an attitude about uh, studying God's Word. And he's warning them here in Luke chapter 12 uh, to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Verse 2, For there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Hypocrisy is a hidden attitude or a sin of, of being one way but actually being the other. Being a hypocrite. It comes from a Greek word that referred to an actor on the Greek stage who would play different roles. Being the same person, he would have one mask for one role, take that mask off, and put another mask on for another character. Now how many people come to the church building, come through the door, and they put on their religious mask. And they go through the motions. And when they get out there and they get with their family or they get with their co-workers, they take that mask off. And they're just as worldly as everyone else. That's a hypocrite. And you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see how many times Jesus condemned hypocrisy. And it is called leaven here. Why would he refer to hypocrisy as leaven? It permeates a dough, permeates the dough. It, it's a leavening effect. And the, the leaven, as he referred to in, in Matthew's account of the, uh, the doctrine of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it has a leavening effect in, uh, in a person and in an organization. It's yeast. It causes bread to rise. That's why we take unleavened bread without any yeast when we take the Lord's Supper because that, that's what Jesus used when he instituted the Lord's Supper. So there's that permeating attitude that can come into us 
if we're not careful. Verses 4 through 7, And I say unto you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? Or um, uh, this talking about copper coins there in verse 6. And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very head, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So he's, he's telling them in verse 4, he says, I say to you, my friends, you don't be afraid of those who will kill the body. That's all they can do to you. So we should have, if we have a right relationship with God, we should not be concerned ultimately with what they are going to do with our physical body. And he's saying that because of the persecution they were going to face. The, the, the actual uh, uh, killing of them, the torturing of them that would take place in the first century. Uh, we were told uh, from the historians that all the apostles died a martyr's death except John. John may have been the only apostle who died of natural causes. Uh, we're, we're told that Paul had his uh, head chopped off. He was executed that way. Uh, we're told that Peter uh, was taken to be crucified and he requested to be crucified upside down because he did not want to die the same way his Lord died. He wasn't worthy. And so they killed him by crucifying him upside down. So they, they were not concerned. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. Don't be concerned about what they do to your body. Be faithful into death. Revelation 2 and verse 10, I'll give you a crown of life. That's all they can do is kill you. But verse 5, Luke chapter 12, verse 5, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him after he is killed has the power to cast into hell. I say unto you, fear him. Who's that? Or fear God. So don't fear man. Don't worry about that. But you fear God. And here's something that's very interesting. He, he's talking uh, to people in, in another context. In Matthew chapter 10. He's talking to his disciples when he says that. Now disciples, uh, we're told in the religious world, they shouldn't fear hell at all. Their ticket's punched. They're going to heaven no matter what they do. But Jesus told his disciples, God is able to cast you into hell. So fear him, respect him, fear God and keep his commandments. Ecclesiastes 12, the last few verses tell us because we're going to be brought into judgment. Every secret thing, whether good or evil, will be judged by God. So we are to fear him, respect him, and do his will. So don't be concerned with what people do to your body. God is a uh, Aware of the animals there in verse 6, uh, five sparrows are sold with two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God. God is aware of all of his physical creation. You read the book of Job, you seen that, see that brought out, how he's aware of the, of the physical creation. But the very hairs on your head are numbered. Now, on some people's heads, they don't, he don't have to count as much as on others. <clears throat> I'm quickly getting there myself. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. He knows how many hairs you got. He knows everything about you. That's basically the point. He knows everything from the top to the bottom. He knows everything. So do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. I wish some environmentalists believed that. That human beings are more value than any endangered species. Any kind of animal. Humans are more valuable than animals. Now, we should not hunt any animal to extinction. I think that would show us to be bad stewards. Uh, but for us to bend over backwards and stop progress and to, and to just uh, bow before nature as the environmentalists want us to do so that we won't hurt an animal or hurt some sort of creature that might be on the endangered species list is not what you find in the Bible. The Bible tells us that man has dominion over the animals. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. He has dominion over everything. 
God placed man here to have dominion over creation. And we are more of more value than many sparrows. Beginning in verse 8 through 12, he talks about those who would confess him before men and uh, those who would uh, uh, speak against the Holy Spirit. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So we know in context here, he's talking about the work that those who would be inspired of the, inspired of the Holy Spirit would be engaged in. So that's why he warned them about don't, don't be concerned with those who would kill your body. Verse 8, he talks about confessing me before men. Now, what does that entail in the few minutes that we have? What does that entail in confessing Christ before men? The word confess means to say the same thing, to acknowledge a truth, to say the same thing. Now, what would all that entail in confessing Christ? Whatever you do in word or deed. So it's much more than just saying, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That is part of it. That's the great confession a person makes before they, they're baptized into Christ. They're, they're confessing their faith. They're confessing a fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That they have come to a realization and a belief in their own life that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it involves their life confessing with our life that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Those two things must go together for us to make a complete confession. Some people make an incomplete confession or a hypocritical confession in which they, with their mouth, would say they believe Jesus is the Son of God, but they live as though He's not. Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus asked the question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So it's much more than just wording the words. It's a, an acknowledgement of who He is and a life of submission to that confession. And He says, You confess me before men. The Son of Man will confess uh, that person before the angels of God. We'll be confessed and what, they, what Christ will confess before God and the angels is, this is one of my followers. You see by his speech, you see by her speech, you see by his life, her life, that's one of my followers. I'm going to confess you before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So here is a person who denies me before men. To deny is to deny who Jesus is. Now they might with their lips confess him, but with their works deny him. We don't want to be in the category of those who, who, who would confess verbally, but with our life uh, deny who he is. We're, we're not practicing what we confess. You've heard the expression, you should practice what you preach. We should practice what we confess. Now, in the very short time that we have, what are ways that we, uh, we do this on a weekly basis, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Think about Sunday morning worship, Sunday worship. Do we not do it in our songs? When we are singing, we're singing our faith. When we sing songs about Christ, Him being the Son of God, we're confessing our faith. Do we not do it in the Lord's Supper? As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we show forth His death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we are showing forth His death, that He is the Son of God, and that He died for us until He comes. 
So the, the, the Lord's Supper, as we partake of that and remember His body and His blood, we are confessing that He is the Son of God. What about in our prayers? When we pray in the name of Jesus, we are confessing. So that confession uh, takes place on Sunday morning. In our preaching, when the preacher preaches, when the teachers teach, they're teaching about Jesus. They're confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we take what we believe and we take it and we go out and we, by our life, give an example and by our words and by the material that we hand out, evangelize, we are confessing to the world that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that is a part of our confession, confessing uh, as well. So verse 10 is going to take a little bit longer explanation than just the few minutes that I have. So we're going to stop there and next week uh, take up with verse 10 of Luke chapter 12 where he talks about speaking against uh, the Holy Spirit and that not being forgiven. So we'll take up uh, with Luke chapter 12 and verse 10 next week.